Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Devin Cooper. I am the director of debate at Cal State Long Beach. And so I'm recording this video to give you a little bit of the introductory understandings of uh, critical performative or um, critical apps that could exist on this topic. Um, this is not going to be an exhaustive list, but just some of the ideas that are going through my mind about the topic itself. So I want to start with everyone watching a video that I found to be very, very intriguing. Um, something that was inspired by a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement and um, a lot of the protests that were going on recently. So check out this video and it kind of situates a little bit of the spirit of what some of the performative debate elements should try to embody or try to um, hint at in your constant criticism, the way civil society is structured. So I've, I've been seeing a lot of things talking of the people making commentary. Um, interestingly enough, the ones I've noticed that have been making the commentary are wealthy black people making the commentary about we should not be um, rioting, we should not be looting, we should not be tearing up our own communities. And then there's been an argument of the other side of we should be hitting them in the pocket. We should be focusing on the blackout days where we don't spend money. Um, but, you know, I feel like we should do both. And I feel like I support both. And I'll tell you why I support both. I support both because there, when you have a civil unrest like this, there are three types of people in the streets. There are the protesters, there are the rioters, and there are the looters. The protesters are there because they actually care about what is happening in the community. They want to raise their voices and they are there strictly to protest. You have the rioters who are angry, who are anarchists, who really just want to fuck shit up. And that's what they're going to do regardless. And then you have the looters. And the looters almost exclusively are just there to do that, to loot. Now, people are like, well, what did you gain? Well, what did you get from looting? I think that as long as we're focusing on the what, we're not focusing on the why, and that's my issue with that. As long as we're focusing on what they're doing, we're not focusing on why they're doing. And some people are like, well, those aren't people who are legitimately angry about what's happening. Those are people who just want to get stuff. Okay, well then, let's go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Let's ask ourselves why in this country in 2020, the financial gap between poor blacks and the rest of the world is at such a distance that people feel like their only hope and only opportunity to get some of the things that we flaunt and flash in front of them all the time is to walk through a broken glass window and get it. That they are so hopeless that getting that necklace, getting that TV, getting that change, getting that bed, getting that phone, whatever it is that they're going to get is that in in that moment when the riots happen and if they present an opportunity of looting that's their only opportunity to get it we need to be questioning that why why are people that poor why are people that broke why are people that that food insecure that clothing insecure that they feel like their only shot that they are shooting their shot by walking through a broken glass window to get what they need. And then people want to talk about, well, there's plenty of people who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got it on their own. Why can't they do that? Let me explain to you something about economics in America. And I'm so glad that as a child, I got an opportunity to spend time at PUSH where they taught me this, is that we must never forget that economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the north do you understand that that's what we came to do we came to do the agricultural work in the south and the textile work in the north now if I right now if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly I didn't allow you to have any money I didn't allow you to have anything on the board I didn't allow for you to have anything and then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you that was Tulsa that was Rosewood there are those are places where we built black economic wealth where we were self-sufficient where we owned our stores where we owned our property and they burned them to the ground so that's 450 years so for 400 rounds of monopoly you don't get to play at all
Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them. So then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play and every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your monopoly money. And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're going to catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, I, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood, how can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is fixed. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. And if the social contract is broken, why the fuck do I give a shit about burning the fucking football hall of fame, about burning a fucking target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the streets and didn't give a fuck. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract, so fuck your target. Fuck your Hall of Fame. As far as I'm concerned, they could burn this bitch to the ground. And it still wouldn't be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Very, very, very powerful video. And so I think that this is kind of the spirit of what a lot of the performance ethos <clears throat> should kind of embody, that we should be upset about the way that social conditions have oriented themselves in civil society today that have pushed us to have to have topics like this. Now, of course, it is a bit of a coincidence that a lot of the uprising and a lot of the um, movement-based inertia has come on the backs of like this topic and I feel that this is a very important time to have these discussions to get people who may not understand the privileges that they may have or the way that they are situated in the world to try to get a glimpse of what it's like to live in certain communities and how these communities are affected by policing and sentencing and forensic science that have made it um, intolerable or made it so much so that we have become uh, detached from the reality of folks that exist in worlds that don't have a lot of the credit lent to them or a lot of the humanity extended to their existence. And so I think that you have a very big responsibility and when you are doing this style of debate or performance debate, that you are actually bringing truth and knowledge to a system that has always been set up on the failure or the demise or the disposability of black, brown, and other bodies of color, right? And even feminine bodies and other bodies that perform themselves in ways that are not always valued um, or held to the normative standards of what we see to be respectable or that we see to be um, desirable in a lot of cases, okay? Okay, so now I'm going to start with my slideshow with some of the things that I feel are <clears throat> important contributions to this discussion when you're debating this topic or trying to have more um, critical or performative approaches to it. 
So uh, when we think about performance debate in itself, it's seen to be any style um, or content that really differs from a lot of the traditional policy debate that's steeped in like cost benefit analysis, like the stock issues, plans, United States federal government action in a lot of ways. And so debate um, about the political consequences and actions or inactions of debaters in the room is literally what a lot of performance debate and other styles that are more critical are trying to engage in and saying that like it's not that those particular systems of the United States federal government don't matter but more so we need to question the spaces in which we occupy as debaters right here and right now right and of course that we don't really necessarily have agency over a lot of the United States federal government structures, or a lot of times those institutions are beyond a lot of the comprehension that we need to engage in skills that help us matriculate through our societies in the way that we live in the world, right? And so a lot of times what you have to do is question what is the what is your relationship to the resolution? What does a relationship um, entail? Like what is it that you're trying to make a statement about within the resolution? Now, I know that there are a lot of teams or some teams that might think that, you know, we should say after resolution, we should talk about these other things, but I think that it is very pivotal to the conversation about criminal justice that we really educate ourselves about some of the mechanisms and the ways in which criminal justice has shaped and formed itself off of the backs of certain people and how that looks today. Because a lot of people wouldn't even see that um, this term criminal justice is even credible because there's not really a lot of justice in it. It's more so just us, right? And that we have to question a lot of the distribution of how certain policing and sentencing gets divvied up onto certain bodies as opposed to others, right? And so when we think about the alternative debate or non-traditional styles of debate, we see it's comprised of things like embodied argumentation, polit uh, personal political identity and narratives, and also performative and stylistic choices and the ways in which we come to understand those things in relationship to the resolution. I don't think that we should necessarily throw out the resolution this year when it comes to performance debate. I think we should heavily engage it and find ways in which we can see ourselves as organic intellectuals or folks that are living in the moments or in the times of how a lot of the revolutionary spirits of particular movements are coming to like boil up and to boil over a lot of the structures that exist right now. Okay. Um, so another thing is that we need to look at is political consequences, right? And this is like kind of looking at a, the discursive and symbolic meanings of the way that you engage in debate, right? And this can be positive or negative and how we look at what things that people will advocate for in debates and what those things politically become received as, right? And what I mean is that like we are having conversations about criminal justice. And so if we think about who does that affect and how does that exist in a world within a political polarized climate that we are in right now. Like how does that have particular meaning for how we engage the debate? And why is it from a particular social location that we think that we should look at the resolution in a particular way and what political implications do they have on us as people, right? And, and you as a debater in yourself, what is your political stance for the topic or against the topic and what does that mean and what consequences does that have for the debate space in general or even you know a lot of the spaces that exist in the world and so what we like to see is that you know when we think about um, the way society is structured, we think about macro politics, right? More of the high um, national, international law and institutions that exist. Um, we think of the meso, which is more of the provincial, more of the um, middle range institutions that regionally exist, right? Or the way that we structure um, society and uh, looking at how that interacts with the other levels, right? And then the last one we see is the more micro level of society, right? The micro politics that exist that that in that compiles who we are as individuals, um, grassroots organizations, um, grassroots organizing, like political instances where we find ourselves and how we relate to trickling up 
to things like macro and meso forms of politics. And so I think that that has an effect and that a lot of people will say, we need to focus on the macro level of politics because that is where a lot of change happens. But if you can see right now that a lot of the political inertia and a lot of the movement-based politics is pushing on the system to make a lot of these reforms and making people say that we need to think about more of the civilian checking boards of like the police or that we have to think about how we can defund the police and like a lot of these movements are pushing on the ways in which um, macro level politics exists. And a lot of that starts from the micro, right? And so that micro, we cannot leave out that por portion of the conversation or to think that macro politics is the endpoint be all because I think that it's all about having a constant struggle against um, systems of power and privilege, especially the criminal justice system, right? Um, the next thing is about actions and inactions, and this is concerned not only for what is said in debate, but the totality of what is done within and around. Um, and so we like to think about the importance of the outcome of debate and not just thinking about the win or the loss, but what educationally or politically have we received from this space or what have we learned from the actions that are posited in this round and sometimes people will say and do things that are very negative and that you oftentimes will have to stake the round on now what i will say is that when you are getting into debates about criminal justice not everyone is going to be perfect or not or understand the language that they're using in the context of um, certain people that they're talking about but at some point, you have to be able to hold people accountable and responsible for the ways in which they've created or exacerbated a term of criminality or how certain people or populations are seen as criminal. And I think that if you are going to be willing to stake the round on that, you have to sit on that issue and make that the only thing that you talk about when it comes to the um, subsequent ending speeches in your rebuttals like the either it's the 2AR or the 2AR right you have to really sit on that issue and talk about how that implicates society how it implicates the debate space what effect does it have on you why the judge should be held responsible and accountable and how they have jurisdiction over the things that people say in debate and to punish them in a way that makes them realize that this is how people live and you should be punished for the way that you have constructed those particular populations in a negative way and this is not to say that punishment is always the most productive form of knowledge construction or the way that we should posit ourselves in the world but we have to understand that there has to be some accountability held for the way in which people have talked about certain things in debate rounds and how they should be held accountable for those things um, the next thing is debaters in the room all debaters are performing but it's about how these performances are situated and how they are implicated within a system of domination or a system of dominance or oppression or whatever ism that you choose to isolate as your theory of power to approach the debate round. Now, what I, what I mean by theory of power is how does power operate within the lens that you are trying to advocate for with your performance or with your critical ad? Is it like talking about neoliberalist structures? Is it talking about entanglement? And this is not the Will and Jada stuff, but more of a, 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 a theoretical assumption about how certain institutions or certain positions of power entangle with each other to, to create um, an intersection of how those things are articulated and we can talk about that later um, or is it like patriarchy is it transphobia is it cis sexism is it like uh, settler colonialism anti-blackness what is it that you are trying to draw on things that have been ignored or have been over or under theorized in civil society and how those actions in this debate round can prop up those mechanisms and how can we what can we do in the round to ameliorate those things or at least strive towards a certain um, pedagogy that can change that or a certain form of praxis or the way that we exist or be in the world that could change how we learn and understand those things because the most things that we get out of debate, it could be political skills, it could be education, it could be ways in which we can learn how to survive. But at the end of the day, what is it that you as a debater in the room are performing and how does that performance um, implicate larger structures or what does it mean for those particular skills to be exported into larger civil society? Okay, um, so performance and debate in itself, um, performance theory itself is concerned with unrailing subjugated knowledges or um, knowledges that have been silenced along 
um, a trajectory of history and how your particular body or bodies in general perform themselves in certain environments that explains how in terms um, we can look at the everyday lived experiences or the politics of everyday life that people are living under. Because a lot of the conversations that you'll see in debates about criminal justice are not going to be steeped in the everyday lived experiences of people that are um, within those confines, right? And so we have to think about um, how that theory of um, a performance is something that we oftentimes have to question and how we have to figure out how does this politics that you're engaging in in a macro level determines or overdetermines the lives of people on the micro right and how the everyday lived experiences are oftentimes overlooked when we have conversations about policing and sentencing and um, forensic science and how that affects people. Um, but most people also consider performance teams, um, people that don't engage in a lot of the normative traditional policy analysis, or they're making very stylistic choices about the politics that they choose to embody, right? And that's, that's not to say that those things should be subjugated or that those things are not important because they definitely are a fundamental part of debate. And it is good to have have people that are pushing on the traditional foundations of debate because you are speaking to some of the future leaders, doctors, lawyers, judges, and folks that are in this world that are going to be making decisions about other people that look like me or other people that look like other folks of color. And so we have to be able to have conversations with those people here so that they understand that when they're in positions of power, that they cannot forget about us, that they have to understand the everyday politics that exist for people in um, structures like criminal justice. You have to see how those live realities are something that we have to always think about when we make policies, right? And so a lot of people that are in the performative realm are getting advantages off the performances themselves or the speech acts that they do in the debate or how they can um, um but rather than like the imaginative politics of thinking about fiat as something that is you know productive right because fiat oftentimes becomes illusory and it becomes a ruse of um, a fantasy space that people want to escape the material reality that is existing around them and it's going to be a really um, interesting sell to tell people of color in debate that we should ignore a lot of the structural realities that exist to produce a lot of the anti-black and settler colonialist and you know transphobic violence that is existing in our world right now okay so when we think about critical affirmatives, these are affirmatives that have critical components as well as some traditional aspects that might exist. Some of these apps might still have stock issue based um, understandings or advantages, but they are trying to aim at um, having a form of analysis of society that doesn't always include a performance. You don't need to have a performance, but there is some um, politics within this that is trying to distract away from the business as usual politics as it exists right and so um you definitely de sometimes have an advocacy statement um or roll the judge or roll the ballot or some type of framework that you're going to defend because there has to be some type of um stable understanding of what you're going to defend in the round unless you're engaging in a form of philosophical um abstraction that you're not going to try to tie yourself to uh, advocacy or um, a locus point. And that's fine too, but you have to be ready to defend those things. Um, it also tries to accomplish a, a goal or task within a particular theory of power. Like I said before, anti-blackness, neoliberalism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, any of those particular forms of power that you want to um, draw from to make a, a, a particular affirmative. Now this, this AF may have a plan text or may not right but the thing is is that the plan text if it is there it is not oftentimes something that is going to be really um argued for the most part it's probably there just as a a tie to the resolution but sometimes it actually is something that people are saying we should advocate for um and how we can look at the state or the united states federal government as a a, a heuristic or viewing the the federal government as just a political stance that we're trying to engage in not that we have to be held to all of the history and knowledge and cultural practices of the united states federal government but that's up to you right now one of the things that i think is or two of the things could be examples i think under this lens um an affirmative that can that can either symbolically 
or literally defund the police by reallocating or redirecting funding away from the police departments or to other government agencies or local municipalities, municipalities or other grassroots organizations that are already doing the work in these communities or having some form of solidarity with the communities that are already doing that work, right? And I think that your affirmative can be a form of uh, consciousness raising or awareness raising about certain grassroots organizations or even certain grassroots understandings of how we should defund the police. And I'll, let's not get a little bit bogged down with that phrase here because that phrase is just literally just means that we're trying to say that the police are overfunded right and there are certain instances where people call the police that police are not necessarily needed to be called on like if someone's having a mental breakdown or someone is having a heart attack you don't need to call the police for those things you need to have the resources directed at the particular institutions that might deal with that now that could be a social worker or um, a paramedic or it could be somebody who is in a different um situation that is not going to come with brute force or come armed for a situation that doesn't really call for that because in a lot of cases we see that folks um end up being killed even when they do call the police and that's a really sad occurrence that exists and has been structured by um, a lot of the fear of the police that exists now and a lot of people don't want to call the police because of certain situations. Like think about underage drinking, right? Like if you are at a party and people are engaging in underage drinking, which is something I would never advocate for, which I think is terrible, but oftentimes they don't want to call the police because they feel like they're gonna get in trouble and they're, you know, their parents might get in trouble, things of that nature. But instead, if we had an outlet for people to call certain services that are there to deliver care, if there is an instance of alcoholism, then we can, you know, we can have that be a more productive transition to how we engage in alternative institutions to address certain harms that exist in our society, right? And so I think that a, a, a symbolic or literal defunding of the police is something that could be a good affirmative on this topic, especially in the realm of policing, right? Another aspect of this, I think, which could fall into sentencing and policing as well, is to reject the logic of cages or caging children at the border or la frontera, right? And I feel like there's a lot of um, Latinx scholars and a lot of um, scholars that are writing in the colonial or decolonial way or um, people that are engaging in a lot of indigenous pedagogies or people that are engaging in um, scholarship that is trying to be anti a lot of those colonial structures that have produced the things like La Frontera or the border because um, those particular forms of policing and sentencing of people to cages is literally um, a lot of the zones of sacrifice or exclusion or the um, politics of disposability that we engage in when we separate families or we put them in cages. And then we had the question, why is it that we feel that it is okay to put people in these shabby or very sad conditions that they are below the humane capacity and to think that just because they are undocumented that they should deserve to go in cages. Now, another thing that I really wanna say about this particular debate in itself is that a lot of the rhetoric that people are gonna use is to say things like people are illegal aliens or people are illegal. That is never ever an acceptable language to, to describe folks that exist in this category because this is not, um, this is not something that gives them humanity or to extend a level of humanity to them. What I will say is that people are not legal or illegal. Acts and things are illegal, not people. And to say that certain folks are illegal populations is very destructive and strips them of humanity. And it shouldn't be something that we ever let come out of our mouths, right? Or even if your parents or your family or your friends say any of those particular things, they should be checked in that moment to say that there are different um, social conditions that we never look at to see why certain people have to um, leave the places that they occupy to seek a better life for their children or for themselves because of the way that 
certain structures of colonialism, imperialism um, have been situated in their homeland or their home countries have made it so intolerable that they have to leave. And so this is why we have to think about a lot of stuff that Kimberly Jones said in that video is that we are always questioning the what as opposed to the why. And that questioning of the why is a better stance for us to be in because that's the problem is that when we look at issues of crime and justice, we always want to look at the what and what about that crime as opposed to why certain people have committed those crimes because a lot of times that type of um, allowance is not steeped in how we question crimes that are com com committed by black and brown folk. But if we think about a lot of the mass shooters that exist, we often want to say, oh, but why did they do this? How do we look at the ways in which they've come about to understand the, uh, this, the, the, the mass shooting? What is the mental um, um, capacities that have happened in their lives? What experiences have brought them to this? These are never questions that are oftentimes levied towards folks that are black and brown. It is always the seek to punish first mentality as opposed to questioning why people have done certain things. Like a lot of people that are talking about looters and rioters that existed during um, the Black Lives Matter movements and protests that existed not too long ago. People are saying, oh, those looters are not about doing anything. And it's just like, that's not the question that we're asking here. A lot of that stuff that pe like you know that people are looting is based in a lot of the capitalist structures that we live under that have created this illusion that we can get access to a lot of these fancy luxury products, but at the same time, profitizing profit um, profiting off of the labor of folks that even that make those things right. And it's just like if we don't have access to those particular forms of American dream values that you have instilled upon us and say that we should ascribe to, you are oftentimes creating this unattainable goal that we can never achieve. And if that is something that people have to loot to get to, then have at it because that oftentimes pushes people to think about the society in which we live in, because I don't necessarily believe that the society in the world and America as itself was not constructed off of anything but looting and about taking and the pillaging of certain groups of people and the unearned privileges and the particular laws that have been passed to structurally exclude certain folks to build the backs, build itself off of the backs of black and brown folks in this country and indigenous folks. And that is problematic that we want to devoid that form of history, but then jump to say that those looters are unproductive and they're not doing anything that is um, good. Right. And so we had to think about this out the world that we live in and the society that we live in, particularly in America, has been built off of looting and taking of land and land grabs and, you know, different logics that have been built in, in those structures. OK. Um, the next thing is more embodied arguments. So the performing of your politics or what I like to you know, understand as from many people and debaters that come before me and the debaters that were after me, um, putting your body on the line, right? And that is performing a particular politics that um, makes you look at your political stance on the topic and how you have rationalized the ways in which your body is implicated. And a lot of people do this through several ways, right? They can have poetry, right? And creating poetry is something that is a, an imaginative aware, awareness of experience of how we can see how certain emotional or cathartic responses have meaning, sound, and rhythm, and how we can articulate a world and imaginatively approach creating poems about the society that we live in and what does that mean in terms of the resolution and what does that mean when we construct those poems to have a material reality or to breathe life into a lot of the everyday lived experiences that are people that are uh, living under these structures exist in. And I think poetry is a very powerful tool to illustrate a lot of the injustice that exists in the world. And I would definitely have y'all think about reading um, uh, Tupac's The Rose That Grew From The Concrete to look at how some of those structures and everyday lived experiences come out in that book of poems. And even a lot of um, poetry that is written by a lot of scholars that people um, uh, think about and debate like scholars like Gums, right? And how she's writing about um, certain material realities that exist for Black women and for other women and for uh, 
people collectively um, as people of color. And I think that those are some of the ways that you can look at structures of poetry, because I would also advocate that you should be creating your own poems or think about how you can um, understand your life from a poetic stance or how poetic justice is something that we should be seeking as opposed to criminal justice, right? Those are just some play on words that you can think about. Um, also, people might want to engage in freestyling or rapping in debates. It's like a musical vocal performance that incorporates rhythm or rhythmic speech or um, vernaculars that have become from the hood or from the streets or from other counter hegemonic sources and people people that are speaking about the grieved communities and how um, criminal justice has affected them because you know a lot of folks can understand that hip hop and rapping and things of that nature are counter hegemonic forms of thought that are speaking to the cultural performances that exist and I would say that you should look at some of the hip hop scholars that um, that have written books about these things, particularly people like Trisha Rose, um, uh, Kitwana, I believe I'm saying his name probably wrong, but um, a lot of those scholars have defended hip hop as these cultural codes that are steeped in the music or steeped in the rhythmic melodies of how we are embracing um, this music as a CNN to the black and brown community, right? And so I think that that rapping and utilizing that form is definitely a way to counter hegemonically perform the body within these lenses but you know you should practice that and also like you know try to innovate the way that you do that you, I, I would not advocate that anybody just pick up and start rapping in debates because that doesn't always create a good um mechanism if you don't practice it i mean and here is where i think about folks um like Oklahoma CL, George and Rashid, who were phenomenal at this, um, and other folks that existed in debate that came before them, um, like DP and um, debaters at Fullerton that were doing a lot of this stuff. Also people from the Louisville Project like that were doing a lot of these counter performances, like specifically my all-time favorite person in debate as a you know, forever, Sh uh, Chantrice Martin, who was my debate partner at Louisville for a period of time, and how she would use rap and poetry as a way to express her particular individuality and creativity. And I think that those were some of the most phenomenal performances that I've ever seen in debate, right? And so I think that looking to past folks that have done this in debate and thinking about the blood, sweat, and tears they put into it, um, and particularly people like Elizabeth Jones, right? Those have always been idols that I've had in debate that have done this very, very strategically and very creatively and beautifully. Um, and so also the other thing you can think about is cultural and social narratives, right? Those are oftentimes spoken or written accounts of uh, connected events, either fictional or nonfiction, or a story that you can use to try to illustrate um, something that exists within criminal justice or stories or narratives that have led people to mistrust the police or people to mistrust the system at hand, right? Because we always have to question the why and not always the what, because that is a different understanding or counter hegemonic narrative that has not always been given airtime or given um, priority right and also personal narratives just like any particular personal experience that you have with criminal justice in your communities or in your life that you might want to express and advocate that as um, a form of productive knowledge construction within debate now there are three i think very critical um bodies of knowledge that people should start to look into right and some of them um, have not been given as much airtime as others in debate, but I think that you should look at a lot of the foundations. Um, and so the pictures of the folks that I have here, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, Roberto Unger, and um, Jared Saxon, they're all people that are representing um, some of these fields that I have here. So I think critical race theory is one of the fundamental um, starting points that have jumped off a lot of the race theory as it exists. And so critical race theory is a um, theoretical framework 
in the social sciences developed out of an epistemic philosophy that uses critical theory to examine society and culture as they relate to categorizations of race, law, and power, right? And a lot of the scholars that came from this, like Derek Bell, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, are very powerful in their analysis. And it has oftentimes created a lot of the foundations of a lot of the things like Afro-pessimism, Afro-optimism, but people oftentimes don't reference them as much as they should even though they were a lot of those knowledge construction came from a lot of these people and it has of course formulated into its own form and discipline but a lot of the knowledge and predecessors that came from that are these folks right and i would definitely say that one of the books that you should refer to when it comes to Derek bell is um, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, which I think is a very good piece. It talks about a lot of the permanence of racism in our society. And I would say, even looking into this concept of interest convergence, right? Interest convergence is a theory that definitely talks about how the progress that exists in society um, has come at the expense of people of color based on the idea that the way progress has happened for people of color in society, particularly America, has been based off of if the convergence of interests of white folks have converged with those of, color, of people of color, right? And a lot of people like to point to, um, particularly Derek Bell points to the Brown versus Board of Education case as one of those moments that interests of white people converged because we were at a time of war with the Reds, right, or in the Cold War, right, and so that we didn't want to seem as hypocritical to the treatment of our people when we're calling out communism in other places around the world, because they could definitely point to us and say, well, you're engaging in segregation, you're disavowing a lot of the Black people and lynching and doing all types of things to Black people. And so this Brown versus Board of Education came off of the momentum of trying to create the perception of, um, how the United States is doing a good act, right? And that particular act is something that really sanitizes the face of imperialism because if we think about now, schools are more segregated than they are um, than when they were during the time of segregation. And we have to often think about how, how is that possible and why is that a thing? So if you look at like this quote that um, Derek Bell has at the top here is that it appears that my worst fears have been realized. We have made progress in everything, yet nothing has changed, right? And so a lot of that spirit is what has embedded itself in a lot of the um, later um, analysis or knowledge from formations like Afro-pessimism, right? And so when we think about critical race theory, it has created a lot of the um, conditions of possibility for other race-based scholarships to come about, right? And I think that a lot of the arguments that exist from um, critical race theory are um, a very good um, starting point. And I would also recommend to you the Derek Bell Reader, which is another piece that is compiled of a lot of um, essays that talk about um, things like race traders and racial realism and things of that nature that we should probably see as um, fundamental parts of this topic, right? And so, um, yeah, so those are good things to think about. And some other um, particular books that I think are very important. Um, uh, Democracy in Black, which is another book that I think is really good on these arguments. Um, the Racial Contract by Charles Mills. Um, I think that this particular book, The Racial Contract, kind of speaks to a lot of the things that um, Kimberly Jones was speaking about in that initial video when she was saying that um, this co social contract social contract has been broken, right? And that we were given this, this idea, this liberal idea that, you know, if we were to surrender ourselves to this social order and to remove ourselves from the state of nature, that, you know, a lot of that Hobbian, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, like those particular theories about social contractualism is that when we create this social contract, we hand our power over to those authorities that are supposed to protect us. But Charles Mills is arguing that that did not really ever include Black people or other people of color or Indigenous folks, right? Because 
within that racial contract, we left out folks like women, like indigenous folks, and to see those folks as non-human or not having the capacity to enter into a contract in itself is what created that racial contract or the sexual contract, which also exists as well. Um, and so you might want to look at those concepts because I think those are very fundamental understandings because within criminal justice, we see that we say that we shouldn't commit crimes because of the social contract that we agreed, agreed upon. But people break that social contract all the time um, and commit a crime, and so we have to police them, right? But at the same time, how can we look to those people that are policing us that are actually killing us or that are actually doing very corrupt things to make it so that our lives are worse, right? And so um, that's a little bit on that. Now, the next one is critical legal studies, which is a theory um, that more so focused on like law in itself and how it was intertwined with a lot of the social issues um, that exist, particularly stating that the law has its inherent social biases that exist. Now, this was not always just about race. This is more of a focus that is steeped in like class analysis, but also it intersected with other forms of oppression that oftentimes later were talked about by other scholars, right? And this Roberto Unger guy is on one of the people that was one of the pioneers along with like Kennedy Duncan and, um, even some scholars that we oftentimes don't want to always claim, like Catherine McKinnon, but those are still people that are in that lens of critical legal studies. And so the proponents of this believe that um, the law supports the interests of those who create the law, right? And so this kind of has some intersects into like critical race theory, but a lot of people from critical race theory then started to have more of a deeper analysis, like people like um, Richard Delgado um, and folks that were questioning questioning law and the understanding of procedural fairness and how it exists and is not always extended to people of color. That procedural fairness in itself was created by those who gave permission to say what fairness meant in the first place, which speaks to the critical legal studies, right, is that we create criminal justice um, in the lens of those who are in power so that we can say that there are criminals that exist out there and we have to find ways to situate them, but for people that are in a dominant position in society can say, oh, we're, we're not the criminals, right? We are the people that create the laws, and right? And a lot of the mentality behind that is that I like to refer to one of the cards that me and my partner used to read is um, by this person named Gannett. And it said that like the constitution and the laws embedded in the way that we structure the world are already assuming a white male bias because white men existed prior to the law. And so when they created the law, they made themselves exempt to it. And so if we think about the experience of black and brown folks and other people of color in America is that we always have to live as amendments to that structure of law in the first place, right? So we think about things like the 13th Amendment, we think about the 14th and 15th Amendment, right? If we think about um, the three-fifths compromise, right? The, you know, that the way that we uh, established the electoral college and the way that we looked at populations, right? And how we had to see black people as three fifths of a human so that they would not outnumber the folks of um, the slaveholders that existed in the South. So we made, they made black people three fifths of humans so that that can be the count in which they engaged in. Um, and so with that said is that we had to constantly have things like the 13th Amendment that allegedly abolished, you know, chattel slavery as it existed. But of course, when we look at the 13th Amendment, we see that there is a clause that says, unless you are duly convicted of a crime, right? Which means that that set up a lot of the um, particular um, structures of the prison industrial complex that allowed for the incarceration and mass incarceration of Black people in the South, right, in places like Louisiana and um, where we have places like the Angola prison, right, that is one of the worst prisons that existed in the United States. And so this then allowed for the propping up of like private prisons and things of that nature. And so this is why the 13th Amendment is kind of that ruse of like, oh, we freed you know, slaves, and we've, uh, we've allowed them to not be enslaved people anymore, but that law supports the interests of those who created the law in the first place. Let's not really think that the people that were engaged in, um, that were engaging in abolition were all so friendly to Black people always, because within that historical narrative, they were saying that, yes, the 
system of chattel slavery is bad. But when it comes to those Black people competing with us on the job market or doing things to accumulate wealth, nah, 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 nah. That's not something that we really want for them. And Frederick Douglass called out a lot of this stuff, right? Particularly in his 4th of July speech is that like, you know, like how are you up here saying that we should celebrate 4th of July when it's just like, how people are not even allowed to get access to humanity in certain ways and that there are people that are still enslaved, right? It's just like, that's crazy. And so when you think about a lot of these, these laws that have been constructed, we always have to look at like, what is the interest behind them and why were they constructed and who are those laws supporting? Like even the Civil Rights Act of 64 that we have to constantly amend and constantly change because it doesn't include certain um, populations, right? And the Supreme Court just, you know, came down on um, saying that like certain protected classes of people are protected by the um, Civil Rights Act of 64 and like a lot of the 14th Amendment values like due process and things of that nature. And it's like this constant having to see yourselves as amendments to the constitution or we have to live as particular policies that have to push and say that this system is made for us when it was never created for people of color in the first place it was created to protect dominant classes against those people hence why we have criminal justice right and so you have to think about those particular things now of course the last thing um afro pessimism which is you know making that harsh ongoing criticism which is necessary um to um the ongoing effects of anti-black racism colonialism and historical processes of enslavement that have created um a lot of the policing and punishment that exists now like transatlantic slave trade and the impact on structural conditions as a personal subjective and lived experience and the embodied reality of a lot of black folks that exist now right because if we think about it um the whole reason why a lot of the police were created in the first place is to be slave patrols and how certain white people were deputized, well, most all white people were deputized um, during the uh, 17 and 1800s, were deputized to try to always um, capture slaves and bring them back to um, their masters, right? And white people were codified in law to like make those procedures relevant and necessary. And so this is why we have to oftentimes think about how those structures come about and what have those structures been used to police people as. And so of course, you know, black people are oftentimes, you know, subject to social death, right? And the ways in which we have been situated into the world and how our bodies magnetize bullets, our bodies magnetize certain police violences, right? And that is oftentimes a lot of the themes that exist in Afro-pessimism, that Black people have been natal alienated and genealogical isolated from the world, and that causes a lot of those problems that, that produce the gratuitous violence as it exists. And that gratuitous violence we are seeing being lived out on the everyday experience of people in the streets. This is the multiple and countless names of trans women, black women, black men, brown folks, right, Latinx folks that are all being subject to these violences that are gratuitous in nature, that are oftentimes overlooked and not seen. And it's so bad that we have to keep naming off, you know, the countless people that have been killed by this system, as opposed to making the productive changes that are needed to make it so that we don't have to list those names off and say their names, okay? So another thing when it comes to critical arguments is that the topic or the affirmative or negative constructs or represents populations or doesn't represent them or misconstrues them in reality that they live in. And that the reality that we have to understand is that the inevitable failure of the criminal justice reform that could posit itself, right? Because it feels like we're chasing this pipe dream that criminal justice can be reformed, right? But in actuality, we're just going to get back to the same square one of trying to always create more and more policies to police the ways in which the police are acting towards us or the way that sentencing happened or the way that forensic science is oftentimes embedded in the form of objectivity that isn't always going to work for Black people or even certain other feminine populations, right? Because if we think about forensic science, and this is something that we were talking about in our lab, is that, you know, um, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit of triggering things that might exist when it comes to sexual violence, right? And so if you want to pause this or fast forward um, this 
conversation, um, you know, there's things that exist like rape kits that are, you know, a part of forensic science that oftentimes those things are unattainable, they're not available to folks, or oftentimes folks have to pay for them, right? And it's just like very much so problematic when we think about that form of forensic science is that we oftentimes put the onus on the person who has experienced the sexual violence to have to pay for their way to have to find the the aminus against them or you know have to always um do these things that put their bodies on the line in ways that other folks don't or even women of color that have to oftentimes be seen to have the fight to be seen as victims, right? Because a lot of the victim status is never ever lend to people like Latinas or Black women because they're oftentimes already stereotyped into of, of being hyper aggressive or hot tempered and that they could have fought off their aggressor, right? So that those forms of forensic science don't always account for or think about how they're structurally opposed to women of color, right? Because white womanhood is oftentimes seen as the ideal victim. And when you try to measure up women of color, to that particular situation, it is oftentimes a no-win situation, right? Or even, you know, when we think about um, women across the Asian diaspora, right? That we have to, we think about them as some form of um, soft femininity that they become like, you know, punished for the way that they exist in the world as well. And even like some of the, the stereotypes that are like posed upon like um those that are seen as um yellow right and like those stereotypes have very problematic assumptions especially very colorist assumptions on how people are constructed or women are constructed from the asian diaspora and you know even using the term Asian is something that is very problematic because a lot of folks would like to be seen as identified by the particular culture in which they come from, like if you're a Filipina or if you are Japanese or if you are Vietnamese or Thai, things of that nature are better ways to identify po folks, but a lot of times folks have accepted a lot of these um, pan-ethnic identities to like simplify a lot of those things. And so I think that those are things that also can be made arguments right and so we have to oftentimes think about how forensic science and how policing and sentencing has an effect on certain populations um, that are feminine bodies and even thinking about transgender folks right is that the law has never oftentimes been fair to any folks that existed within that particular community and it's very sad that we have to say things like trans lives matter or all black lives matter because a lot of those um a lot of those conversations have not included them. And we oftentimes misgender folks. Um, we often deliberately on top of that. And so that we have to understand that there are transgender folks that exist out here that we should not disavow and that we should not like treat as they're not human. Right. And I feel like there are going to be arguments under this topic that are definitely going to talk about how prison industrial complex affects transgender folks and how those um how the law and criminal justice reform never ever accounts for their experiences right and it is very problematic that some trans folks get put into prisons that um are based on the uh the the that are based on the the assignment that they're given at birth right and that is not correct it is very problematic and disgusting how that works within the criminal justice system and oftentimes they are subject to so much violence when they're put into those positions or even subject to a lot of the sexual desires of those folks that are very problematic in themselves okay so i think that we need to be thinking about those populations and how they're affected by criminal justice or lack thereof um and so another example that people can think about is like calls to reform criminal justice have started from the wrong starting point and at the and thinking about the policies instead of the devaluing process of certain peoples that exist around our nation right and is that like 
it is the punishment mentality that is oversaturated and over-policed on certain groups of people that we have to oftentimes question. Because those policies are things that are important to think about in this analysis, but if we just try to legislate away people's hearts and minds, that is not going to change that. Right? We can pass laws all day long, but it's not going to change the process in which we devalue trans folks or we devalue folks that are women or we devalue black and brown folks and black and brown folks that are women or men right? and other um, identity categories. And so we have to think about how can we structure and think about the libidinal drive to destroy those particular people and how that devaluing process has come about and how we can make different um, lenses to um, think about those things. Um, also using the critique um, to transform it into more embodied modes of advocacy or something greater than just cards or text like performances, right? That could be a thing. And so one of the examples that I think about too is that we're gonna think about criminality and who is the face of crime. And the face of criminality presents a myth of constant threats or existential problems that justify the existence of policing or censusing of the other or people of color. This mentality of punishment is exported internationally through colonialism and imperialism, right? Because a lot of these technologies of torture and um, policing and also jailing have been exported to places like Guantanamo Bay and other private prisons around the world, right? And even in the military industrial complex, it has heavy ties to the prison industrial complex as it exists, right? And we have to have those international criticisms of these things, okay? Um, so a lot of the personal identity argumentation that I think is here that exists, um, debaters reveal and engage in specific personal situations and experiences unique to themselves based on their social location. That is like their race, sex, class, gender, sexuality, citizenship, ability, disability, things of that nature. So for example, I can think of a, a case that could come up pretty soon about policing, um, anti-black and anti-brown policing, police that are given military um, aid based in weapons or, um, you know, just weapons in the schools or military style weapons to patrol or to contain students in urban schools, right? And a lot of personal experience of what happens in those particular communities when it comes to police and how the school to prison pipeline has been something that has definitely been a prior privileging focus of a lot of the urban schools that exist in. Like for me myself, I went to one of the quote unquote, rare schools in Baltimore City. And so we definitely had, you know, presence of um, metal detectors, police that are armed, right? And, you know, a lot of those military style weapons are given to police students and to contain certain populations, but you never oftentimes see those in, you know, the privileged schools or the schools that exist in the counties of um, privileged folks or wealthy counties that exist around the world because those populations are given more of that why as opposed to the what that Kimberly Jones was talking about, right? And so thinking about those particular experiences might be something that come up right, in these particular debates. Um, performance of cultural identity and social identity to challenge assumption about groups within the resolution is definitely something that will come out, like I said before, about cages, Latinx folks, trans folks, right? Um, and another example we can think about is um, legal reformism and criminal justice are just logics that are steeped and tools to pacify certain populations to trick them into believing that justice is attainable in the lens that we have now, especially it being an unethical system. And so the way that we can think about this in debate is that this is just like the structures of debate, right? And that how there is a particular privileged style of debate that is steeped in a traditional form of policing and those structures that are based on that style that sentence debaters of color or people that want to der der derail away from the norm, that they are structured by by um, getting the sentence of a loss, right? Or that people are not being able to see their particular way. And this is very problematic, the way that people have definitely policed certain styles of debate that exist um, and even have created certain organizations like the PRL, which is something I'm not gonna really get into, you can ask me about later, the Policy Research League that has made itself very visible and very politically polarized within the debate community to um, make it so that a lot of debaters are deputized in their very anti-stylistic approaches to these particular styles of arguments. And we have to think about how those logics get exported to the larger society as well, is that if we can make secret organizations that are trying to 
push on to create certain um, methods of analysis. How do you think that gets formulated into the legal system, into the criminal justice system, into voting, into teaching, into policing, right? That becomes one of those mechanisms that we can create very sanctioned approaches to people and how um, we can police them strategically in this community and export that to the larger society. People could also play on the words of the resolution like reform and say how that is bad, it doesn't go far enough and that we have to engage in abolition, right? Or abolitionist form of politics, right? And you'll hear this term a lot, but there are very different analysis that people come to when we think about abolitionists. Now, regardless if you're looking at the Dylan Rodriguez or the Angela Davis or other scholars that engage in abolition pedagogy or abolition praxis, um, a lot of them are talking about how we need to have this conversation that projects and, and puts abolition at the forefront and that it needs to be linked to the abolition of prisons, the abolitions of instruments of war and the abolition of racism and other structural mechanisms that existed in our society to create these things. And some people that exist in the abolition pedagogy oftentimes um, will focus on how prison abolition and the willingness to locate the prison within liberation movements is something that is fundamentally important, important to constantly push onto the system because that particular system um, has been created and shaped but not limited to the material and institutional conditions of the prison in the prison industrial complex right and that there is no formula that exists to understand how abolitionist rhetoric or abolitionist pedagogy might come into fruition or how that is going to be something that is embodied but the thing is, is that there has to be a vision of how systemic violence and institutionalized dehumanization, whether that is culturally, politically um, oriented, has to be at the forefront and that um, we have to be able to create a abolitionist praxis that does not singly concern itself with the abolition of prisons, but more so trying to understand how there can be certain radical social formations that when we sin when we center like um when we center the prison as a central site for that catalyzing of a broader pushing against the macro and the um, meso and even the micro forms of aggression that exist for people of color those alternative understandings of abolition are very necessary right and so we have to be able to think about the punitive human um, captivity that exists is something that is exported to the larger society and how people that exist in the prisons are very vulnerable populations even if they committed the crime or not those people are still human and that they're still posited with a litany of violence that is structured towards them even when you leave the prison structure right the world that you will come into is not always going to be welcoming it is not always going to give you a job or give you a, a, a restorative form of justice right it's not going to be a per, a place of reform but more so a place of um refinement of the tactics that you have to live in this is why recidivism rates are so high is because that when you introduce people back into the world you don't give them the tools to be reintegrated right and so if we abolish or have an abolitionist pedagogy that makes us question a lot of those systems and to reform the institutions that exist we can have a better way to integrate people into a caring community or into a world where they can be reformed from the 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 questions of why they come into those places right because the prison industrial complex system as it exists right now is always concerned about the crime that is the what and never the why for people of color and so this is why when we look at abolitionist pedagogy it, there is a vision and a political desire that understands that we have to struggle for human liberation from those particular institutionalized and state sanctioned violence that is imposed upon particular populations that have been resulted from the school to prison pipeline and other cradle to grave logics that have made it so that one of the major populations that are over existed and overpopulated in the prison system are black men, right? 
or even black women as well, right? And so we have to question why that is. And a lot of that is steeped in the 13th Amendment and how people were able to codify prison industrial complex into law in the first place, okay? So here's a list of certain things that you can do in debate that are performative or have certain engagements, right? I'm not going to go through a lot of these because I feel like you can probably situate them on your own, like having solidarity with a movement, right? Like BLM or other counter hegemonic movements that exist. People can sing in debates, right? Singing revolution songs that could exist. Um, people using languages that are seen as foreign, like Spanish, like um, Subwano or other indigenous languages that exist, right, to resist a lot of the ways in which um, legalism has excluded those particular indigenous voices. Um, you can use narratives, you can use stories, you can have dialogues between you and your partner. Like I said before, poetry and spoken word or rapping can be um, using that verse to try to um, hedge against the counter hegemonic things that exist um, in the perspectives. You can use media like music, videos, pictures, art, right? All of these things can be forms of performance that you can use in debate that makes a lot of the um the performance pop but you have to definitely have defenses of why these things are good and why those things are necessary right within your particular performance so um what i'm gonna get to is a lot of the structure that you should think about or things that should be included in your critical affirmative right so what number one you should definitely always have some type of political political or philosophical backing that is connected to the methodology like things like constant philosophy critical race theory feminism animal studies existentialism or afro pessimism any of those things i talked about before critical critical race um analysis um critical legal studies, things of that nature, right? You have to have a way to situate your knowledge in the theory of power so that you can explain how power operates within your critical F or your performance. Because that's very important. Or even if there's a multiplicity of those things or there's an entanglement of those things that exist, then you can definitely have to express what that theory of power is. Um, I think that you should probably have an advocacy. What do you think should be done? What do we think we should advocate for? How should we challenge the particular X thing that you have said is important? Or if you choose not to have an advocacy, that is up to you, but you have to have some way to situate the knowledge or how the ballot is structured, right? Or what the judges should do or what should we be advocating for in this round, right? And so this is also another thing to think about is the role of the ballot or the role of the judge or the framework that you have. How do we orient impacts in this round? Or what do we see the judge should view themselves through? Or how should the debaters see themselves in the um, ontological perspective of the debate itself, right? And so you want to be asking those questions. You don't have to have all of those things, but you should have an uh, inclusion of something that exists from those lenses, right? And so the role of the judge is oftentimes questioning what should they play? Who should they be? And there's going to be a lot of judges sometimes that don't know what their role is, or they don't understand what their particular understanding of criminal justice within the lens of the things that you're saying should be. And they'll use that as a cop-out. And I think that you should definitely say, this is what you should be as this judge in this round. Or I think the ballot represents this. The ballot represents a form of restorative justice. The ballot represents a form of reparation for those who've been incarcerated from wrongly or unjust practices. Something along those lines, right? And the impact is definitely something that you should definitely think about, right? Those impacts should be based on some type of systemic harm that exists or an action that has um, happened by the other team that they perpetuated, right? Whether that's anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism um, sexism, heteronormativity, anti-blackness, some other form of racism, ableism, ageism, transphobia, um, some type of imperialism, right? You have to figure out how that particular structure theory of power has produced a, a particular form of impact, whether that is over killing of certain populations, over jailing, over policing, recidivism, any of those things that have been um, structurally imposed by those theories of power, right? So I think sometimes those theories of power are not independent impacts in themselves, but more so internal links to how those impacts are situated in the world and how those impacts can be produced by those particular theories of power. So you wanna think about that. Um, 
The other thing you might want to include is preempts to certain arguments that traditional teams or other performative teams might try to say, right? Some people might say that you may not go far enough, that you're still a meaningless reform, or you're just a lukewarm or pseudo approach to the topic. You have to have answers to that. You have to think about how you're going to preempt framework or topicality and other popular arguments against um, K teams like capitalism, bad arguments, or anthro arguments, right? Um, and I think that like a lot of people might seep into the anthro arguments as well because people will say the mistreatment of animals is the prerequisite of caging animals is why we can cage people or cage humans. And that is gonna be a very interesting debate to have, but it is one that will exist because you exclude animals within your conversation of policing or caging, right? And that could be something that is imposed against you. And also capitalism and neoliberalism is definitely some catch-all phrases that people like to say is a root cause of your particular performance or the root cause of your critical affirmative that you have to have a little bit of preempts to or think about how you already got to the question of capitalism or neoliberalism in your um, advocacy and how that exists. But you have to be able to ward off the singularity understandings of how capitalism and neoliberalism are the primary and prior questions that we must ask and answer, right? So those are some of the elements that you should definitely have in your affirmative. Definitely need to have them, right? Because these are all elements that are going to be pushed in the debate and people are going to question these things, the impact level, your advocacy, your role, the ballot, your theory of power. These are oftentimes things that people are going to attack within the lens that you're debating, okay? Now, we oftentimes have to think about what are the impacts that are more structural or performance-based, right? And there are implications for what that performance has said and done, people have done in the round. And so we should be focusing on how organizing, structuring, root cause claims, or um, how those things exist based on what material issues or impacts come out of these particular theories of power. Because there are two types of um, impacts that exist in debate, consequential forms of impacts and structural impacts. And so when you are debating or engaging in more of of the um, performance style debate, you're gonna be looking at a lot of the structural impacts, anti-blackness, neoliberalism, patriarchy, dehumanization, colonialism, structural violence. Those things are more of the structural arguments that are going to exist. And so you have to be able to ward off and find explanations of why those things on the right produce those things on the left, like nuclear war, economic collapse, disease spread, food insecurity, um, nuclear proliferation, global warming, because those, these topics and these forms of consequential impacts are going to find their way into these debates regardless of if this is a domestic topic or not. And so it is your job to be able to have an explanation of how those systems that you are trying to criticize create or are the structural conditioning or the organizing principle or the root cause of how those consequential impacts come about, right? Because a lot of people are going to say to you, there's approximate causes that we need to focus on because root cause analysis or structuring claims are oftentimes always bad and they gloss over certain particularities, right? But you have to have an explanation for those particularities and have an explanation of how those things exist within a realm of social relations, okay? This is very important that you do when before you even think about creating an F. Think about the theory of power that you want to draw from and how you can create explanations for those theories of power as they exist, okay? So that was what I had to say about this particular topic. Hopefully that this will give you a little bit of introductory analysis of how you can think about debating alternatively or performatively. And feel free to ask questions or contact me and I'm here for those things. Thanks, everybody.